Good afternoon, everyone, and we're thrilled you can join us for today's WCET webcast, Declining Enrollments, a Cliff or a Shift. Please take a moment and introduce yourselves in the chat and let us know where you're joining from. We're excited you're here. My name is Kim Naraki, Assistant Director for Events and Programs at WCET. We'll put a link to the slides in chat so you can download those as, if you like. And as we go through the webinar today, if you have any questions, please enter them in the question box and we'll get to them during the Q&A portion. If you put your questions in chat, we often lose track of them. You can follow the Twitter back channel using the hashtag WCET webcast. We are recording and we'll share that with you by next week. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Patty O'Sullivan, Manager of Content Development and Special Projects for Every Learner Everywhere, which is a division of WCET. Thanks for joining us today, Patty. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, as Kim said, my name is Patty O'Sullivan, and I'm the Manager of Content Development and Special Projects at Every Learner Everywhere. I'm also the Working Group Lead for the WCET Steering Committee. With me today are Colleen Fulkenstern. She's a senior research analyst at the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education and co-author of Witchy's 10th edition of Knocking at the College Door, a report which he has been publishing for over 40 years on projections of the numbers of high school graduates for the nation, four geographical regions, and the states, including public high school graduates by race and ethnicity. Also with us are Gates Bryant and Dan Brennan of Titan Partners. They are co-authors of From Cliff to Escalator, While the Five-Year Higher Ed Enrollment Outlook is Less Dire Than Some May Suggest. Uh, this post is around declining enrollments in higher education. Together, we are going to discuss how, discuss how institutions of higher learning are not all impacted equally by enrollment decline. Um, we're going to talk about some strategies schools are using to maintain their financial solvency. And we're also going to talk about how the pool of college learners has shifted over the last few years. Um, so Colleen, let's let's start with you. Um, you are one of the researchers um, and author of uh, Knocking at the College Door. Um, this outlines this this resource, which um, I think Kim is putting in the in the chat, the link in the chat for everyone. This resource outlines not only the decline in college bound students, but offers a great deal of nuance in terms of how the decline will affect different types of colleges and different regions in the country. Can you share with us some of your findings? Um, yeah, thank you, Patty, and thank you all for um, participating today. As Patty mentioned, I am from the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education, um, referred to as WICHI, um, which is kind of the, you may be familiar with, um, as the parent kind of organization for WCET. Um, so yeah, we definitely have some findings to share as I'll run through just with a few slides, um, just so we're kind of all looking at the data at the same time and the visual representation. So as Patty mentioned, we've been doing the projections of high school graduates um, for over 40 years. And so these data right here are the number of high school graduates. And what you see in that kind of lighter gray color is that after several decades of, of increasing growth in the number of high school graduates nationally, um, you start to see a more leveling off um, as we move into kind of that black section. So this is the first um, years of our projection. So the most recent edition of projections came out in 2020. And so what we see here is that um, we have kind of a slowing down, but a continuing increase in the number of high school graduates um, from around 3.77 million in the class of 2019 um, up to around 3.93 million in the class of 2025, which is sort of kind of seen as the peak in the number of high school graduates. Um, so in some some folks might call that blue section where you start to see the demographic cliff. Um, we at which you don't use the term demographic cliff, as you can see through these data, it's not so much of a kind of drop off, but rather a slowing down in the number of high school graduates um, and leading to around three and a half million high school graduates by the class of 2037. Um, so if you kind of think about well, what's underlying these trends, um, if you look at the next slide, 
Um, that kind of just simply puts that really underlying these trends is birth trends. So um, I'm not going to go into our methodology. If you use the link that was put into the chat box, um, you can see a lot of different resources, um, including detailed methodology that we use, but kind of the starting point of our projection model is the number of babies born annually. So this is US births per thousand. So as you can see, um, around the Great Recession is where we started to see that decline in births. So if you think 18 years later, that's where we start to see the decline in the eight, um, traditional age uh, high school graduate population around 18 years old. Um, and so they follow the trends fairly similar. And um, one thing that's not on here is the more recent years. So obviously, um, if you've seen news um, out of 2021, we saw a continued decline um, in uh, births in 2020, and then a little bit of a recovery in 2021 as well. Um, so this just shows kind of that birth trend and as, um, as kind of the precursor to high school graduates 18 years later. Another kind of key trend from the Naki report is the variation by state in trends. So on the next slide, this just shows the projected change in the number of public high school graduates from the class of 2019 through the class of 2025 by state. Um, so that orange color is going to be increases, blue color is going to be decreases. And so you can see that across the country, there's wide variation. There are states that are expected to have um, decreases in high school graduates in the short term. And then you have some states um, it, that are very dark red, Idaho, Nevada, um, the Dakotas that are expected to have pretty substantial increases in the short term. So um, this is just really meant to show the nuance and variation that exists across the country um, that these kind of national trends don't necessarily um, demonstrate. And also I'd add in that link that Kim sent out to the knocking website, there are state profiles and you can really dig in state by state on their trends as well and kind of view how the, um, particularly in the Great Lakes and the Northeast, that the, the declines are really propelled by significant declines in their white populations. Um, whereas kind of the diversity that I'll touch on in a moment um, is not, not enough at, in those states to offset those declines. Um, so on the next slide is shows the further out time frame. So this is from the class of 2019 to the class of 2037. So if you recall from that original line chart that I showed, that would be kind of as we start to see the declines um, as fewer babies were born during the Great Recession. And obviously the color of this chart is much different. A lot more declines across the country. Um, the states that already were seeing declines, steeper declines. If you look at Ohio, Michigan, West Virginia, Illinois, um, and then, you know, some things to note, big states like California expected to decline. Um, but of course, there are some states that are also expected to have more high school graduates um, in 2037 than they did in the class of 2019 as well. So um, just kind of a high level overview of state variation. And um, if you look at the next slide, the other kind of key trend that came out of the 2020 um, projections, and this has long been in um, our projection series, we put them out about every four years, we kind of refresh the projections, um, is the diversification of public high school graduating classes. So the data we rely on, we have um, counts of high school graduates by race ethnicity just for public high school graduates in the country. It's about 90% of high school graduates. So as you can see, just over 50% of graduating class in 2019 identified as white, non-Hispanic. Um, about a quarter were Hispanic, 14% uh, Black, non-Hispanic, 6% Asian, uh, Pacific Islander, uh, non-Hispanic, and about 3% two or more races. Um, and then there's about 1% American and Alaska Native. And you see over the next 15 to, uh, years how graduating classes are expected to diversify. So with the declines in the white high school graduates, among increases among the non-white high school graduates, um, we are going to have much more diverse classes um, overall nationally moving towards a majority minority in our public high school graduating classes. Um, and I just have one more quick slide um, to touch on this kind of trend around the diversification of our high school graduate population. Um, and this just shows the trends by race ethnicity from the class of 2019 all the way through the class of 2036 um, and where you see the declines among the American Indian Alaska Native, 
um, white high school graduate population as well as black high school graduates. Um, and where you see the growth air, uh, populations among the two or more race population, as well as um, Hispanic population. One thing to note about the Hispanic population, because this has really been an engine of growth for the nation, is um, the birth rate declines that occurred during the Great Recession actually impacted Hispanic population more. Um, so you see that kind of immediate growth and then a leveling out in, um, over the second portion of the projections as fewer Hispanic babies uh, were born from the birth rate declines among that population. Um, and then one thing that light gray is the Asian Pacific Islander, which is a, growthy, a growing population over the course of the projections. Um, and so just one quick note about the uh, data that we use, we use traditional data, um, education data sets. So these are going to be um, single race, non-Hispanic, so white, non-Hispanic alone. Um, Hispanic is going to be any individual that identifies as Hispanic regardless of their race or races. Um, and two or more races is going to be all non-Hispanic um, individuals that identify as more than one race. So um, just an important note as you view these data, in these slides as well as on our website. Um, and that's all in our report and in our methodology as well. Um, so that's just kind of the quick key trends. Um, and I, I kind of encourage you to dig into our website and, and for further kind of uh, narrative and uh, review. Well, thank you, Colleen. Um, Gates and, and Dan, do you have anything you wanna to add to what Colleen has just shared with us in terms of the, the data from knocking at the college door? Nothing to add, but super interesting. Um, we saw some similar trends, but this is great research. All right. Well, now I'm going to uh, toss it over to, to Titan Partners. Uh, Gates and Dan, you researched and authored a post on the Titan Partners website, From Cliff to Escalator, While the Five-Year Higher Ed Enrollment Outlook is Less Dire Than Some May Suggest. Given what Colleen just told us about declining birth rates um, and, and graduation rates, can you explain how the outlook for enrollments is not as dire as, as Colleen just showed us, or, or maybe as the media has led us to believe? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I guess this, this data that we're looking at here is slightly different than what Colleen shared on that first kind of uh, up and down curve, where there it seemed like it was uh, high school graduates, here's any 18-year-old, some of them graduating high school, some not. Um, so that, that would be the reason why we're seeing a little bit different numbers, but the up and down of the curve remains the truth. Um, and before we fully jump in and answer your question, Patty, uh, just two quick caveats to keep in mind in regards to our analysis. So uh, the first thing is we looked pretty much just at the five-year overall enrollment picture, so up to the 2027-2028 academic year. Uh, we felt that anything too far beyond that point would just be kind of guesswork when it comes to the things outside of demographics, which have already happened. We know how many uh, children were born, so um, other variables at play, uh, harder to project that far forward. Um, and then the second piece is that our projection speaks to the overall headcount of students we expect to be enrolled in higher education at large. Um, so we think that's a, far, a, a bit of a more flat enrollment picture than others are anticipating. Um, but looking at enrollment in that macro picture doesn't take into account the financial and enrollment pressures that certain institutions are facing at a more individual level. Um, so while we anticipate kind of a less severe impact of demographic shifts on enrollment than others have indicated, that's not to say that institutions shouldn't be thinking strategically about their futures, uh, whether it's recruiting new students, thinking more about student success and retention, et cetera. Uh, but I know we're going to touch more on that a bit later, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to them. Um, back to your question, um, speaking explicitly on the demographic side of things, um, it, we see from this curve that describing demographic adjustments as a cliff um, might not be the case, and cliff implies that there's kind of a full drop off there. Um, and also, in reality, demographics don't move as a monolith, as Colleen pointed out. Um, for example, we're seeing growing birth rates among Hispanic populations, despite the overall contraction. Um, the cliff motif also doesn't really take into account the population's uh, who wouldn't be new potential enrollments as they graduated high school. Uh, in other words, the adult learner population won't shift just because the number of 18-year-olds will. Um, 
So we, we believe that what's been described as a cliff in the future might more accurately be a, a bit of a downward slope that has some ups for some smaller populations. Um, and, and we've seen those ebbs and flows over time, really. Um, we, we should see growth in certain uh, underserved segments, uh, adult learners, uh, Hispanic populations, uh, Black learners. Um, anything you'd like to add on Titans and Gates? I, I know we, we have uh, more to come on this front, but. Yeah, Dan, I think we should flip to the next slide and talk a little bit about sort of how we think about the factors that drive um, the the enrollment um, picture. So go ahead and present present that. Definitely. Um, so there, there are different variables at play um, in Patty. We had discussed as some of those uh, kind of sync enrollment and others buoy uh, enrollment. Um, so we looked at really a number of variables to inform our projection, not just the ones on this slide, um, but we ran correlations with all of them to see which had the greatest relationship with an effect on enrollment. Uh, ultimately, we end up with these four primary ones, uh, demographics, the job market, changing learning preferences or a, a shift of uh, students towards online learning and away from in-person, uh, and then growth in tuition assistance. Um, so you see on the right hand side those up and down arrows that each of these things plays out a bit differently over time. Um, as we just touched on, uh, demographics are going to go up for a little bit, a higher birth rate, um, and then of course contract. Uh, the job market kind of happens in the inverse. So when the job market is hot, enrollment typically trends down as potential students are more likely to forgo higher ed. Uh, when they have imme immediate appealing job opportunities, which they really have had in the time since the pandemic through now. Um, despite currently living in a hot hiring market, we and uh, the economists that we spoke to to help inform these projections expect there to be kind of a cool down in the next few years, which should ultimately contribute to an increased college going rate. Um, for student learning preferences, directionally, uh, online learning affords additional accessibility and optionality to students. Um, you would think from that 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 might lead to increased uh, participation in uh, higher ed. Unfortunately, at this stage, uh, online learning at scale, I suppose, hasn't been around for long enough for us to have uh, longitudinal data to suggest that that's, that's truly the case, that more students who wouldn't have otherwise enrolled will be doing so because they're able to online. Um, we hypothesize that it could be the case, but at this point, all that we are confident in is that there's kind of a change in the way that the pie is sliced more towards online, less towards in person, um, but the size of the pie itself, uh, unclear at this point, but interested uh, as, as years go on to see what kind of data is available to, to that end. Um, last one here is federal tuition assistance. Um, while the, the data that we looked at, that correlation analysis, uh, suggested that there would be significant enrollment bumps if federal assistance were to meaningfully change, given current political dynamics, uh, things like federal free college programs uh, or, or significant Pell increases seem pretty unlikely. Um, and any slight boosts to Pell, like the $500 increase approved uh, for this year on the max level, um, pretty unlikely to move the needle on likeliness to enroll. So for that reason, we see that kind of flat curve there. Um, and then off to the side, you see that we talk a bit about international enrollment, uh, where we've seen pretty massive recovery since the pandemic, especially at the graduate level, um, and which should remain a pretty strong potential source of students for many institutions. Um, but as we think about strategies for increasing enrollment as demographics, demographics contract, uh, those abroad definitely a pull to keep in mind. Um, but I guess looking at this picture overall, the thing with the greatest unknown impact here is the job market. The births, they've already happened, number of 18-year-olds to come set in stone. Um, online learning might be a factor to help with individual institutions' growth yet to be seen yet whether overall growth might happen as a result of a shift towards online um, and then federal tuition assistance unlikely to swing. 
Um, but I guess separate from letting those market forces kind of just do their work on their own, institutions do have agency in the recruitment strategy, other institutional plans to help shape their enrollment outlooks, uh, which I know is a point we're all excited to come back to later. In the meantime, though, uh, Gates, anything on the above? Yeah, I would just underscore um, that the way segments of the higher ed landscape experience this macro picture um, depends a lot on where the institution is located. Um, Colleen's data um, highlighting the regions of the country that are expected to see greater or, or lesser amounts of, of population growth um, as is just one example. I think the other example of, of how this varies quite considerably from one segment of the higher ed landscape to another is in the program portfolio mix. And so underneath this factor of growth to the job market is an implicit uh, variation by the kinds of programs that various institutions are looking at. And we're doing some work right now for an institution um, that is based in the Northeast. Um, they experience and are experiencing some of the most challenging demographic um, uh, dynamics. But thanks to their portfolio mix of academic programs that are in high demand job categories, they're actually seeing um, growth rates in, 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 in the markets in which they play, not their own personal growth rates, but the markets in which they play at four and five times the rate of the, of the, the broader region in which they play. Um, and so there's, there's, there's can be quite a bit of difference and variation, um, you know, depending on the, on the program mix. Uh, so region of the country and program mix are the big drivers we see of, of variability uh, as it relates to the factors that we're explaining here on this chart. So I'm, I'm curious, and then this is for all the panelists, um, you know, Colleen's reporting really talked about birth rates, uh, high school graduations, and and Titan's work is is really kind of fleshed that out a bit and said that there are other factors, other populations going to college. Um, I and I'm just I'm going to bring in a, a personal example here, but I'm associated with the University of Mississippi. Um, we're experiencing the biggest class size ever. Um, since I've worked here and I've worked at the university for over 21 years. Um, and yet I have colleagues who work at schools that are in danger of closing. So what, create a picture for us um, of, of what are the types of institutions that seem to be thriving despite um, all of these factors, you know, you've got the declining birth rate, you've got Gallup just uh, released a, a poll the other day saying that the public belief um, in the value of higher ed is, is the lowest point it's ever been since they've started asking this question. Um, wh what kinds of institutions are, are doing well and which ones aren't and, and why? Yeah, I, I, for me, this is what makes my job, our job so interesting, right? As observers and students of the higher education ecosystem, um, the you know, I think what one thing we can say is that here in the U.S., with uh, four to five thousand degree granting institutions, um, we have unparalleled uh, diversity uh, in terms of our institutional mix and representation across the country um, compared to uh, certainly compared to other countries. I would say and it's it's one of the things that's to me fascinating about about the U.S. market and the way um, in which it behaves. Um, you know, to to speak to your specific example, Patty. You know, we we hear about um, institutions that are seeing you know larger than ever um, in enrollment classes um, or um, you know application rates that are higher than they've ever been. Um, I, I think, in large measure, um, you know, the drivers for that um, you know vary considerably depending on the type of institution. Um, that we're talking about. But, you know, some of the drivers for increases um, have to do with um, the institutional, um, um, you know, status, uh, um, large flagship uh, public universities um, 
in general seem to be doing uh, seem to be doing well. Um, although certainly the recent news out of West Virginia University is is uh, is a troubling counterpoint um, to that uh, to that example. But um, you know, public R1 flagship institutions um, you know do appear to uh, in general be uh, performing well in some measures that's due to state specific um, uh, incentives or funding um, programs that are in place or scholarships that are in place uh, to encourage um, students who are graduating you know from that state uh, graduating high school from that state to attend um, those those public um, flagships and so increasingly those public flagships I think are are taking you know more of their fair share of the the local high school graduating. Uh, population and uh, and while I didn't check Mississippi for sure, I'm pretty sure that at least in the South, um, uh, there's certainly favorable um, so, some more favorable population growth um, demographics at play. Um, for for other institutions, and certainly this would be the case for selective institutions, um, you know we, we see um, in incredibly high growth rates in application volumes. Um, this, we believe, is in large measure due to the test optional movement, um, and uh, the test optional movement has um, significantly increased um, the number of applications that selective institutions are receiving. It's also, in, in our view, led in part to um, an increase in the number of applications uh, that generally well-resourced students um, are are sending off to schools tools like the common app and others make it very easy for students to apply to 12 13 14 15 different schools and um as observers in this in in, in the in the in the sector you know we, we see things like application volumes through the common app um, as one metric um we think though that in general that's not a great metric for forecasting um uh, participation and enrollment in in higher ed um, for some of the reasons that I'm that I just mentioned. It's it's a it's a good measure for um, selective institutions generally, um, but even just the application volumes per uh, per student um, is sort of a confounding factor um, at play. So you got to sort through all the noise to really determine what are some of the real driving factors. Um, uh, around why certain institutions are are um, are seeing enrollment growth when others um, are seeing declines. And just for um, audience members who who may be unclear on this, when you say test optional, are you talking about um, SAT, ACT scores? Those as entrance exams. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we're not. So test, that's not like looking at GPA or anything. It's it's just the the. Test yeah, just just the, the the fact that the ACT and SAT are now no longer required. Um, I think at last count, it was at nearly two thirds of the institutions um, in the U.S. Maybe more than that now. Um, so don't quote me on that number. It might be higher than that. Um, but but that's you know that is a and that post pandemic um, has been a one of many significant shifts um, in the enrollment and admissions um, space. Um, and, you know, there's there's some debate about this, but I don't think that um, trend will will likely reverse and go, go back to the way it was. I think we are in a um, likely majority test optional environment for the foreseeable future. Good. So some of the positive things that came out of the, the COVID crisis, we've learned our lesson and, and we're, we're we're keeping them. That's good. We have um, we have a couple of questions coming in from the um, attendees from the audience, and I just want to encourage people to to add your questions to the Q and A. Um, but this um, this one, I guess, Gates, you meant or oh, Dan actually, you mentioned adult learners. One of our um, listeners wants to know what how are you defining adult learners? Um, this person writes, I'd argue the prime workforce age adults 25 to 54 would be the most appropriate considering for enrollments. Also, what data do you refer to showing strong enrollment likelihood for adults, however you define them? So I guess we're just looking for an age range first and then the, the data that um, we might get uh, enrollment an enrollment bump from this population. 
Right. I, I think that age range sounds roughly correct, but I suppose it could apply to any learner or potential learner who previously uh, passed up on higher education. Um, and I think what, what we suggest is less that there's an increased likelihood going forward of adult learners uh, enrolling. It could be possible that as online learning increases, that greater optionality and accessibility makes uh, things more possible to those who are uh, working adults. Uh, it's, it's more so a call to action for institutions that as the share of 18-year-olds contracts, uh, looking for a less traditional uh, segment to, to fill those seats is more what we're pointing to there than uh, data that thinks that it's definitive. Okay, great. Um, Adam, gonna, can I just add yeah, on? Go ahead, um, Colleen. Yeah, I'd love to hear Because I do you. think that there's kind of a, um, as the traditional 18 age population contracts, it's like, okay, we'll just go out and get more adults to enroll. Um, and I think that it is important as higher ed in our systems to reflect on how our systems and structures may not support adults to enroll, right? And so, you know, even thinking about our scheduling, our advising hours, kind of the system of higher education is still in many ways um, made for a traditional 18 year old who resides on a campus or lives within minutes and commutes to the campus. Right. So I think that it is important um, to think through how, as our workforce is changing, how we have emerging technologies that are changing, our higher education system is set up to be able to adapt to that. If you think about something like AI, how do we upskill, reskill um, our workforce in smaller way or, you know, shorter time frames um, to be able to meet our workforce needs as well as supporting adults, right? Because sometimes even just tuition assistance is not enough to get an adult in the door if they, the lost wages that could occur or if they have childcare costs, right? So I, I do think that it's important when we talk about adults that we really understand not only their age, but who they are as people and what they bring um, into their, their education as well. I think those are great points, Colleen. And one thing I would just add is that when we um, when we forecast the the likelihood of adult learners to enroll in higher ed, um, you know, the key variable we are looking at is the trade offs that those individuals are making between the workforce and their education options. And so, at the, at the most macro level, as Dan mentioned a minute ago, when the job market contracts. Um, uh, we we would expect um, to see enrollment in in higher ed um, increase. Um, we are coming out of a period of unprecedented um, economic strength in terms of the tightness of the labor market, um, and we see a cooling in the job market, and and that's really the data that we're looking at um, to suggest that we will. Uh, see a, a modest uptick um, in, in enrollment in, in higher ed is why our prediction is generally kind of, you know, kind of flat in, in aggregate. It's, it's sort of flat with some modest declines um, it, because we're generally um, betting that the economy is cooling and that the job market as a result is cooling. Gates, we do have a, a question <clears throat> from an attendee. Um, about that data, um, this person writes, what data indicates that the job market will slow down enough to make a positive difference in enrollment for the future? Um, but I'm also wanting to, to go back to what Colleen said, that maybe we don't need the job market to cool down in order to accommodate adult learners. Maybe we just need to shift the way we do things. But do you, are, is there specific data um, that either Titan has or that Titan is is utilizing? This person just wants to know what the data is about the job yeah, market cooling down. We leverage data from Lightcast, which takes data from the Bureau of Labor Stats. So um, that that's what's going into it. Um, a lot of different manipulations to that data to forecast it forward. Um, in addition to conversations with economists as uh, neither Gates nor I are uh, them to, to kind of read the tea leaves and see in the next few years what do we think is going on in the market. And the, the aggregate picture was towards a cool down, both data front and uh, more qualitatively. And one of the things that we found in the correlation work that Dan was referring to earlier was that 
Um, historically, people have talked about unemployment rate as the best indicator of the counter cyclicality of the higher education market. In actuality, it's not the unemployment, it's actually job posting um, or job openings that appear to be the, the better uh, the better metric um, and uh, has has a tighter correlation to um, to the higher ed enrollment uh, picture. Um, and so that's that's the specific data that we're that we're using as we think about um, you know the, uh, uh, the the potential to see more more adult learners enroll. But that's like a macro perspective. Colleen's awesome point was really about the micro, which is how are we as institutions equipping um, adult learners effectively in the marketplace of jobs, and how do we need to evolve? the way that that learning and training happens um, to meet the specific needs um, of, of the adult learners. And that's a systemic shift um, that institutions are undertaking um, at the same time that we're seeing cyclical changes in the job market or in population dynamics. Well, let's shift to that. Um... If, and this is for any of the panelists, or, or I'd love to hear you all take a stab at it, if you had a call to action um, for colleges and universities to, to prepare, what do they have to do now to prepare for the class of 2033? What would you tell them? Or I know we don't want to go out too far, Dan, because who knows what could happen um, in the future. But I think 2033 is not, that's only 10 years in the future. Um, how, do you, how do you prepare for that class? I think um, kind of going back to your also your original question, Patty, around the enrollment declines and kind of higher education institutions are positioned so differently right now. So a call to action more broadly, I, I'm not exactly sure because, um, you know, I think that one thing that from that question kind of going back to also around com like community colleges, right? They have had much larger declines in enrollment over the past two years compared to four years, um, broadly speaking. And so I think um, that call to action is going to look differently as they kind of, assess, you know, they're the pillars of workforce, if you really think about it from a state system view, right? So how the call to action there would probably look differently than a flagship four year. But I also think that it's important that those institutions are collaborating with one another. I think that there's a lot of opportunity for uh, more collaboration of shared resources across institutions, not, not consolidation, not merging, but, you know, um, are we utilizing things like course sharing or are we developing, you know, shared curriculums that are, could be used across multiple institutions within a state? So um, be able to meet a workforce need within a state without having to invest in multiple um, institutions. So um, I think that's one thing is like not a call to action to not be afraid to be innovative and collaborate in the next decade as the, the demographics are changing and shifting. Um, and then the other kind of thing that I think is important is really being able to articulate what is your value? What is your institution's value to your, you know, if you're a regional comprehensive institution in a rural part of the Western United States, how do you articulate to your community that you are a value to that community, that people can come in, get the jobs that they want, to the pay that they want and the location that they want, um, right? Because that's that's what they need to be able to see within your institution. Because um, as the top of the funnel of, of kind of 18 year olds is decreasing, you really need to shore up our interve intervention strategies so that the bottom of the funnel, those that you know graduate and enter into our workforce doesn't get smaller, right? We can, we can put in interventions to ensure that our matriculation, our retention um, supports the development of our workforce that's gonna be able to meet needs. So I think those are kind of couple of my call to actions uh, as I think about the data that we've talked about today. Anyone else want to take a stab at that question? Yeah, no, Colleen, that was awesome. And I, I would just plus one everything you said. Um, one thing, and this might be sort of like a uh, one level down below your comments, Colleen, but, you know, I, I think I think the tactics that institutions use um, to uh, make students aware of uh, who they are and what they're about 
um, is also um, on the cusp of significant change. Uh, and the um, and and the the value um, of finding new ways to engage students um, who are prospective students, whether they're adult learners um, or traditional age students, uh, those those kinds of tactics um, increasingly need need to evolve. And um, you know, I have a couple of examples of of that, but. But I think the call to action needs to be for um, admissions and enrollment leaders uh, to interrogate um, every one of their outreach uh, tactics, um, awareness building tactics. Um, you know, there's been uh, post pandemic, you know, a, a fairly robust market for the technology that supports um, uh, virtual visits and uh, communicating, um, you know, the ethos of a school um, through a virtual medium. Um, and uh, there have been some companies that have done um, you know, quite well in helping institutions um, you know, accomplish that goal. Um, you know, increasingly for traditional age students, um, you know, that campus visit uh, is has historically been sort of a watershed moment in the discovery process for students. Um, that discovery process is preference students who have the means and the time and the capacity to go to those schools to visit them. Um, and now this technology that's delivering a virtual visit in a pretty compelling and engaging way um, is, is just one example of a tactic that I think um, can uh, really um, enable institutions to reach into communities um, or geographies that they historically have not been able to um, to recruit uh, very um, effectively from, from. So that's an example for traditional age students. I think um, on the on the working adult level, you know, we we see um, you know growing um, evidence of, of partnerships between employers um, and hired institutions. I'm sure many of the folks on the webinar today are familiar with. Um, intermediary organizations and companies that help um, employers and institutions set up you know, tuition reimbursement programs and upskilling and reskilling um, efforts uh, as well. So those are, again, tactics um, that institutions need to be thinking about and evaluating um, in order to um, you know, operate effectively um, in, in the reality of this, uh, of this uh, still challenging enrollment environment. Not a cliff. Yeah. So here's a related question from um, one of our attendees. There's been a lot of talk lately about the value of a degree or of higher ed education. Has your data shown a significant decrease in the perceived value of higher education? And if so, is it affecting decreasing enrollments? Um, and has it been more pronounced in specific age ranges or specific states or regions? So I guess who who is who are the people who are losing their faith in higher education um, and where do they live? Yeah, do you want to speak to that that other slide that we had? And maybe Kim, you could you could pull that one up if we want to take first stab at answering that question, Patty, and then Colin, you should jump in. That's right. I think it's number 16. Um, Kim, if you're up. Uh... Oh, and it might right be one, one sorry, more not down. One, one more. Down. Okay. Sorry. Great. Um, yeah, so I, I suppose there there's the sentiment element that I know, Patty, you mentioned the Gallup poll earlier, and there's a bunch more uh, out there about people's changing perception and belief uh, in higher ed data here. We're just looking at uh, what the market is speaking to uh, in the number of jobs available, postings, uh, openings uh, by by what degree people have or may not have. Um, so we have these these two big events, Great Recession and COVID-19. Um, we see those sways there for those without uh, a bachelor's or different type of post-secondary degree. Um, curves are flat or up for those with degrees. So there's there's still that signal power and demand there, um, at least through 2022, 2023. Uh, going beyond there, we don't have the labor stats to back that up. 
Um, and it, there, there is that sentiment element where people directionally seem to be losing value. Um, I, I think that Colleen brought up a great point, which is uh, there's there's an element that's on institutions to align their program portfolios with the workforce uh, and meet that demand to ensure that um, higher ed still has a compelling value prop for the next generation. So um, anything to add, Colleen? Um, not so much. I mean, I think that there's, I think that this is a, a great representation of the, of the value of higher education. I think that that um, oftentimes, you know, I see higher ed put out information of kind of the wage premiums and like reiterating what the value is, which I think is obviously extremely important. Um, but I don't think that, that we should lose sight of the fact that like there are still a lot of students that come onto our campuses that don't complete, right? So are they receive? they're not maybe receiving the value that of higher ed that our institutions are then kind of lauding as the value of higher ed. So kind of just ensuring that our, our institutions themselves are also ensuring that the value proposition is remaining for all students and, and accessible for all students as well um, is important. But in terms of the specific question on here, um, I haven't seen anything more at like state specific. And I think that that would be really interesting around the perception. Cause I think there's two different things. There's the perception of the value of higher education and then there's actually the value, right? Like the market uh, outcomes and, and the employment outcomes, like those things are remaining true, whether people, but people perceiving them to be true might not, might be what's changing, right? And so I think that it's important to not lose sight of like, that perception can become reality in terms of how people choose to enroll. Um, but a more state specific one, uh, analysis or survey would be really interesting, I think. So we have a, an attendee wondering um, about what is offered it at universities. And, and Colleen, you, you spoke to this a little bit earlier, but you know, in that that graph that we just looked at, Dan, you know, it talked, it, it showed degrees, right? Associate's degree, bachelor's degree. Um, and yet this, this attendee is asking, um, as more states support skills-based hiring, how may this impact enrollment? And I, I suppose it, I suppose it really is a question about are, is higher ed making that shift? Are higher ed institutions offering something other than the traditional four-year bachelor's degree or two years associates? Uh, do do you see movement there um, to to kind of change up the menu um, to to maybe get more enrollments? Yeah, what it would be fun to do, and I don't we probably not set up for it, is to do a live poll of the audience to see it, what the awareness is of um, you know job requirements not requiring uh, a, a degree um, across the states. And I think we're seeing, you know, some examples of some states that for, you know, state government jobs, they're eliminating the, um, you know, the, the bachelor's degree requirements. Um, and there's a lot of talk right now as to whether or not that's sort of the tipping point um, at, at play here. And I, I guess, you know, from where, from where we sit, um, I would say our, our our opinion is kind of still out on this. Like I don't I don't know if we have a, a a consolidated point of view about this. One one observation I would make is that you know just eliminating the requirement for a bachelor's degree um, doesn't necessarily mean that you are still not hiring on the basis of per, a person's educational attainment, if that makes sense. So. Um, you know, eliminating the requirement might increase your applications um, to a particular job by uh, a certain amount, um, but whether or not the students without the degree are making it through the process um, at, at higher rates than they did historically is, is the jury is very much out and I haven't seen yet the data on that. So we're, we're definitely in this in, in the moment where some could argue we're at a tipping point as more and more I think in particular state employers make that call, right? These are large volume employers um, where, where we're starting to you know, see that happen. Um, and those are, those are potential tipping point moments, but um, I would say that from where we sit at Titan, 
looking at the market overall, I, I don't think we have enough data yet to say that for sure it, it is that that tipping point. So that's a little bit of a nuanced non-answer, but but I think we're we're studying this this situation and following it closely. All right, we have a question here from excuse me, from Joe. Um I'm just going to read it directly. I'm wondering if there are estimates of how competition may change over time. For example, I'm in a city whose population is going to grow slightly, but should we prepare for a larger number of institutions coming into our state? And is there anyone who has done work to investigate what that might look like? Um, I'm not sure. It, I, I'm feeling like when you say institutions coming into your state, like institutions recruiting students in your state, and Joe, if you're still with us, you can unmute maybe to um, clarify that, or you can enter it into the, the Q&A, but uh, I don't know, maybe one of our panels, there's Joe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So institutions recruiting in your in your state, I I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, and and I'll, maybe maybe this will be a helpful um, example. Um, our admissions team here at the University of Mississippi, and we're in North Mississippi, has noticed um, over just the last three five to three to five years um, a huge amount of applications from the north. Um, a lot of people from um, northern northern mid Atlantic, uh, northern uh, middle of the country states northern mid northern midwest and, and new england um and that that's that's really interesting it's it's just another caveat to the picture in new england how um that's the region where there's the most drop off in um um high school graduation because of birth rate so does anyone want to take a stab at that Or do you want me to repeat the question? Are we so far from? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I'll take a quick stab at it. I mean, I think the way, I think, you know, if if you are in a uh, a state that has a growing high school population, um, you will see increased um, competition uh, from other schools um, working to recruit students. Um, to come uh, to their schools, especially uh, schools that are in the Midwest and Northeast that have unfavorable, um, you know, demographics. Um, I, I think the other the other part of um, the increased competition question I was thinking about was, um, you know, you, you will see uh, evidence of institutions seeking to um, enter a new geographic market. Um, by way of you know setting up satellite campuses um, in those places or even acquiring um, campuses from institutions that are struggling um, financially. We've seen Northeastern do this with Mills College um, in the San Francisco area, We've seen Arizona State um, enter the um, Southern California area with um, uh, you know um, launching campuses, satellite campuses. Um, and and so and and so depending on what state and what city you're in, Joe, you, you know you may see some of that kind of new uh, competition as well. And you know I, th I think what what I would fall back on it as a sort of uh, competitive advantage um, is the depth uh, of your institution in serving the the local employers um, and in partnering with the local employers in your region. Um, you should have a head start there. And if you don't have a head start, you need to work on it one uh, because that's, I think, um, the best way for institutions that serve um, you know, local regions uh, to, to serve the, the highest value, which is in, in service of the local local employers um, in, in, that, in that particular market in which you operate. All right, we only have a few minutes left and I, I have one final question before I hand it back over to Kim. Um, and this goes back to something um, Dan and Gates, you touched upon and I'll read it. This is from Ashley. Regarding the correlation between job postings and enrollment, is this taking into consideration the increasing trend, and I've never heard of this, Ashley, of ghost jobs 
Um, she defines it as companies posting jobs they never intend to fill. I've not heard of that. I don't know why they would do that. So I'm really interested if anyone could shed some light on that. Yeah, I saw that in the chat as well and was super interested. Uh, I guess just to clarify the correlation we ran. So while the, the slide that we popped to a couple minutes ago uh, did have posting information, when we uh, talk about the correlation we ran and its effect on enrollment, that was uh, looking at job openings, which come uh, more, more like the actual seats there, um, which is reported to the Bureau of Labor Stats rather than uh, Lightcast, which does uh, great work, great data, but they're, they're more scraping uh, different job websites uh, than they are getting hard and fast reported through government agency data. Um, we also look at the unemployment rate. So uh, that's another thing that may, maybe there are these ghost jobs uh, influencing the numbers, but um, I would expect to be more reliable than uh, if you were to go on LinkedIn and there might be more of a ghost job there. So oh. interesting. So yeah, I suppose if it's, if it's more postings that shouldn't be influencing our analysis, which is more on unemployment rate and job, the actual jobs. Um, when we look at postings, there is that interesting skew. So I'm excited for some Googling on ghost jobs after we get off here. Sorry, okay. I, I no, dropped okay. off for a second there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I was worried you I had an internet, internet hiccup. So I apologize that I missed the 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 end of your answer, Dan. Um, but that's probably a good um, moment for me to hand this over to Kim if my internet is going to be wonky. Um, take it away, Kim, and wrap us up. Great, thanks so much, Patty. Um, and to our panelists today, uh, here are some resources that we referenced and uh, information about our organizations. Um, thanks again to our panelists and moderator for your insights into the this somewhat intimidating topic. I personally feel a little bit better about the enrollment cliff, calling it a shift makes more sense at this point. Um, and I hope you feel a little more um, that we've been able to set your mind at ease as well. Um, we will be sharing the recording with registrants in a follow-up email, and it will also be posted on our website. Uh, you can learn more about WCET, our work, and upcoming events on our website. This year's WCET annual meeting will be hosted in New Orleans, and we hope you can join us. Um, if you are planning on join, uh, joining us, early bird registration ends next week, so be sure to take advantage of those cost savings. I want to uh, quickly thank our sponsors and our supporting members that make our work possible here at WCET. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thanks for your thoughtful questions and have a wonderful day.